Good morning, everyone. My name is Aisha Dixon, and I'm the director of the UCLA Emeriti Retiree Relations Center. And we are so glad this morning to have such a rock star amongst us. So if you're not familiar with Professor Donald Shoup, he is the professor of a retired distinguished professor of urban planning, who is also the 2020 Gold um, uh, Carol Goldberg Service Emeriti Award winner, and he is all things parking. Um, if you're not familiar with his Facebook uh, following, it's called the Shupistas, and I'll put that link in the chat for you. Um, but Professor uh, Donald Shoup is here to talk all things parking. Um, without further ado, Professor Shoup, so glad to have you here, and the floor is yours. Well, thanks for inviting me. I, I was afraid you were never going to ask. Um, I, I hope I can convince you that parking is much more important than you thought, uh, and that it even helps to understand how UCLA operates. Um, uh, parking is a good example of uh, UC President Clark Kerr's observation that universities are very conservative about their own affairs, but very liberal about the affairs of others. Um, UCLA uh, highly values uh, equity and inclusion, but its parking system makes the Titanic look like a one-class ship. Um, it has 175 different uh, types of parking permits, and they're carefully ranked according to the status of every uh, academic and staff member and student. Uh, ranging from chancellor down to freshman, with titles like associate vice chancellor and assistant vice chancellor and provost and dean and endowed professor and distinguished professor and plain professor and associate professor and assistant professor and adjunct professor and um, clinical professor and um, a lecturer and the down through graduate students and undergraduates and the hundreds of staff titles and all of the parking permits are distributed according to the status of your title. Um, uh, major donors also receive parking permits based on the size of their donations. Um, and these, these parking permits are cumulative that the higher status permit holders can park in the lower status spaces but not the other way around. Um, and UCLA reserves the, the, the very choicest parking permits for the coveted X permit, which we uh, emeriti know about. But when you're active, it's very, very hard to get an X permit. Um, so they can park in the spaces uh, exclusively for X permits. Um, if UCLA is an ivory tower, the parking system is its moat. Uh, and um, it's a good example of, of Clark Kerr's observations that the modern university is a collection of individual faculty members united by a common grievance about parking. And earlier, when he was a chancellor at Berkeley, he said, the chancellor's job has come to be defined as providing parking for the faculty sex for the students, and athletics for the alumni. Um, uh, Chancellor Carter said at UCLA, when I mentioned this, he said, parking is the most important issue for everyone at UCLA. Well, UCLA has 23,000 parking spaces, and the parking is more than almost any other campus on earth. Um, if parking is so abundant, how did it become more important than sex and athletics? Um, well, campus parking problems, I, I argue, is, is stem from mispricing and not from scarcity. Well, uh, parking has also been a neglected uh, topic for research because most people think that parking isn't sexy. Well, I think it is sexy. Some of us were probably conceived in a parked car. And some people even think that parking is like sex. If you have to pay for it, it's just not right. And also parking is a neglected topic for research because it seems like watching paint dry. Uh, 
Well, cars are parked 95% of the time and they move only 5% of the time. Um, and all of your cars are parked now. Um, so while almost everybody else was in transportation research was looking at the 5% of the time the cars were moving, I thought I could learn something about the 95% of the time uh, that they were parked and that other people had been uh, neglected. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to share my screen now. And um, and switch to PowerPoint. Um, well, uh, uh, parking is uh, a low class topic of conversation. Um, you don't want people in your party talking about parking all the time. Uh, but uh, that UCLA and other universities have a, a, a not status ranked to parking, but status ranked to research topics. Uh, the national and international affairs are the most important. Uh, state affairs are a big step down and local government seems parochial. And in local government, the, what is the lowest status of thing you could, you could study? Well, it would be, I suppose, parking and, and sewage. Um, um, so I think that, that, that people just have, have thought that the, there's no reason to study Parker. And now I, I've, been, <laughs> I, I, I've been a bottom feeder for 50 years. Uh, that, that there was almost nobody else looking at the issue of Parker. Um, but there was a lot of food at the bottom. And I think I have, have uh, discovered some things that are worth talking about. Uh, and uh, I think the, uh, the, the first issue that I would think about is that, how did we get here? Uh, how did we get to the point where we uh, uh, have so much parking and nobody is talking about it? Well, suppose that uh, Henry Ford and John T. Rockefeller uh, in, in 1900, when the car was born, were saying, what can planners do uh, to uh, increase the demand for fuels and car cars. Well, we'll have separate zones for everything. Uh, that you, you have divided the city into areas where all activities are permitted, housing here, jobs there, and shopping someplace else. So you have the, uh, all these activities separated uh, into different zones, there would be um, uh, more demand for travel between the zones. And then if you hold down density um, and you don't allow much housing uh, in, in many zones, they have to be single family houses and uh, or larger lots. And so that will spread the city apart. Uh, there are limits on the height of buildings um, and that spreads the city out. And then the third uh, option is to uh, require all street parking everywhere. You can't build anything or have a business in anything unless you have all the parking that uh, that are that we require. Um, so um, all street parking requirements are fertility uh, uh, drug for cars, and unfortunately, American cities have adopted all of these three uh, zoning issues uh, for. So for, for, for over a, a century, we have been separating land uses, limiting density, and requiring off-street parking. Um, uh, so the cars are the natural way to get everywhere, uh, that we just have to respond to the world we live in. Um, now, the, uh, the planners didn't intend and uh, to uh, support Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller uh, from they, but they did. And it isn't as though the, the automobile and the fuel industries had to, had to uh, advertise for this or, or lobby for this. It's the people who own the cars who have lobbied for this. Uh, that worked out very well for the car industry and the fuel industry. Um, but we don't have walkable neighborhoods. We can drive everywhere and we can park free in most places, uh, but 
there are not many places where people can walk around. And here's a picture of uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, this is in, in San Jose. This is Cisco Systems. <laughs> and the, the Cisco uh, uh, technology is probably uh, 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 moderating the, the, the session that we're in right now. Uh, and too much of a uh, suburban America looks like this. Uh, um, but we tend to ignore this asphalt blight uh, if we're parked in it. Uh, the parking, uh, the cost of parking doesn't go away uh, just because the driver doesn't pay for it. This is all free parking. Um, and it's at a greater scale than that. They call this a campus, <laughs> hardly a campus. Um, and there's a light rail system rather than on one edge of it. So these, uh, the minimum parking permits have put cities on an asphalt diet for 70 years. And here is an example of the parking requirements in San Jose. I've spoken in San Jose quite a few times. Uh, I've been invited to speak at the government agent uh, conferences and things like that. So I know a lot about San Jose. For a restaurant, is a, a, a thousand square feet in green in the restaurant requires a parking lot eight times bigger than the restaurant itself. And the same for a dance hall. Uh, why would they be the same? I don't know. Or a skating rink at an auction house. Why would they have so much parking and the same amount of parking? They're very different. And uh, animal grooming studios. I mean, uh, do, they, how, do, the, do the animals drive? It looks scientific uh, when you look at the pages and pages of parking requirements, and every city has this. I'm just focusing on San Jose. If you want to know what is the parking requirement for uh, a crematory <laughs> or a, uh, a crematory, but that a for for for, for incinerating people. <laughs> <laughs> or mortuary or social service, you always can look up and see how many parking spaces are required and how much parking we would have, the, 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 the developer would have to provide before we allow anything to be built or to uh, use. Uh, um, it looks scientific, but it's not. People think it, it has something to do with science, but it not. It's 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 it, every land use does have a parking requirement, but that's as close as they get together. And when you look at the individual parking requirements, each one seems to make sense. Um, you know, a barber and the person in the barber chair. There are gender distinctions which are hard to understand. Uh, they seem to require one space per person for everything except religious persons. And even then there are gender distinctions. But when you get away from parking space per person, you have to go to those square feet and, and uh, how, how many spaces per thousand square feet. And given the size of a parking space, uh, three spaces per thousand square feet means that the building is the same size as the parking lot. Uh, and it gets harder for many other activities, uh, uh, but there has to be a parking. The planners have to do that, um, even for the afterlife. Uh, so we have lots and lots of parking. Um, well, I've been uh, advocating getting rid of parking for a long time, that uh, the, the minimum parking requirements are almost an established religion in the planning profession. But I'm a Protestant, uh, and I'm in favor of a reformation. I thought it would probably happen after I was dead. Uh, but it's happening right now, uh, and very fast. Here, in, in the past seven years, these are cities, including San Jose, that have re removed all their off-street parking requirements, um, 42 cities. And uh, one simply changed the word required to recommend it in the zoning ordinance so that effectively removed all of the parking requirements without admitting that the numbers were nonsense. So here was, uh, I guess it was last year, the legislation was passed in, in San Jose. So just <laughs> as a very simple legislative act, cost nothing, uh, they just said, uh, 
there aren't any parking requirements anymore. And so just think of how San Jose has been built the way it looks now. And now we say, well, that was a mistake. Um, now, removing off-street parking requirements, not going to remove off-street parking. Um, uh, there's, there's plenty of it. Uh, so what would happen uh, if we now will happen? I always used to say what will should happen, what will happen now? Um, uh, uh, here's the parking lot. That's the Cisco parking lot. I went there to look at it. Uh, that's research and parking. It's a wonderful place. It's a beautiful place to be if you're a car, uh, but it's only for cars. Well, suppose we remove these parking requirements and I've been speaking to an architectural meeting, and I said, well, here you can have uh, housing around the perimeter. And I took uh, buildings from, from London, uh, which must have been cleaned uh, just before uh, they, we, I took them for a PowerPoint. Um, it's easy to use Power Photoshop, but this could happen. You could, they wouldn't have to have all street parking, the, the new buildings, because there's parking behind. Um, and they could share the parking with Cisco. That isn't the sort of thing that would be built. So I took some buildings from downtown Los Angeles, which are more likely that, uh, that would, would happen. Uh, and if that worked out, just think of the money they could make, uh, that the, the housing is so expensive in San Jose and the land is already assembled. There's not a brown field, <laughs> you just build on it without any underground parking. If, if that was, and people could walk across the parking lot to the Cisco uh, systems. And if that worked out, you could build some more. Uh, Here's what it looks like in downtown LA. It's nothing special. There's a school on the ground floor and a housing above. But as you walked along the street, you would think this is a real city. The new urban is called the liner buildings. Uh, and I think that you couldn't do that without charging for all the parking uh, behind the buildings. Uh, but if people had separate payments for, for housing and for parking, people would learn how to get along with, with one car rather than three. So it would re greatly reduce the cost of housing if you build it without uh, any parking. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, building housing on this, all these lots would do a lot of good. You could create jobs because you, you you can import cars, but you can't import apart, uh, apartment buildings. It would greatly increase the housing supply. The, the commuting uh, is terrible in San Jose because there's all congestion. And you have to you can spend less on cars and fuel, both of which are reported in some cases. All the things that we think are wrong with the city, uh, this would help just by getting rid of the off-street parking requirements. You have to have a lot of technology. Whenever I speak to parking conventions, I say that what you sell is something that we'll have to be using now. And of course, it would slow climate change, uh, that you can't neglect that anymore. Uh, so I think that, uh, uh, that, that I have three things that I recommend. The uh, charge demand-based prices for curb parking. You have to charge prices for curb parking in front of those buildings if you're going to charge for, for parking behind them. And that means the lowest price you can charge uh, and leave one or two uh, vacant spaces on every block. So as you drive along the block, uh, you will see just what you want. There's a space waiting for you, if you're willing to pay for it. Um, and then to make that popular, uh, so to avoid the gripes, the, the thunderbolts for, for, for lightning from, from drivers, is to spend all of the meter revenue to pay for added public services on the metered blocks. That if you have the uh, blocks with meters, uh, then you get the extra services and uh, things like cleaning the sidewalks, uh, planting street trees. Uh, some cities give free transit passes to everybody who lives on the block. Some give free Wi-Fi to everybody on the block. They remove graffiti every night. There are lots of things you could spend the meter revenue on and people would see the meter money at work. And, 
And if the residents are the ones, they're the stakeholders, you say, well, I think I would rather have, have all these uh, public services rather than free, but very hard to find curb parking. And that will increase the political support. And then you could remove the off-street parking requirements, which uh, well, San Jose has already gotten rid of the off-street parking requirements. Now, if people are going to start building on these lots, they'll have to manage the curb parking. Uh, you have to adjust the prices over time to maintain, maintain a few vacant spaces that uh, they'll be cheaper in the morning and more expensive in the midday and maybe uh, cheaper late at night. Uh, you want about 85% occupancy all the time. So that all you have to do is look at the, <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the curb spaces and you'll know whether the price is too high or too low or just right. Uh, because if you see one, one space is available, the price is just right. And that's better than having no open spaces. Uh, say San Francisco is the first city that started this, and they, they hired a graphic designer to show what they were intending to do. If you have some blocks that are completely uh, uh, occupied, others have uh, vacant spaces, can you just uh, move, shift, nudge up the price on the top block and nudge it down on the bottom block and get what is the right occupancy on both blocks? Um, uh, most people think that change, charging market prices for curb parking is a wrenching social change, like, like is the reformation or prohibition. Uh, but I think it's a very small change. If cities can't do that, what can they do? It's as simple as the, the, the children's uh, fable that you always learn, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. And 15% vacancy is just about right. Well, San Francisco uh, uh, spent, they got a $20 million grant from the federal government to do this. To, uh, uh, and they, fortunately, they, they provided a video that only lasts two minutes. So it's probably more important than anything else I'm going to say today. But here the video shows what, uh, what they were expecting, uh, what has since happened. Finding a parking space can be frustrating and time consuming. It's estimated close to a third of city traffic is caused by drivers circling while looking for a space. Some drivers just give up and double park. This clogs our streets and needlessly pollutes the air. These cars slow down public transit to get in the way of emergency vehicles. And drivers focused on finding parking create a hazard for pedestrians and cyclists. There is a better way. San Francisco is testing new parking technology and a flexible approach to pricing that is designed to make parking work better for everyone. SF Park's goal is to have at least one parking space available per block. That way, drivers can park near a specific destination without the need to circle the block or double park. This also provides a steadier flow of customers for business owners. SF Park provides safer and clearer streets for everyone. Here's how it works. Newly installed parking sensors detect when a parking space is available. Drivers will be able to check parking availability and rates online, by text message, or by smartphone before heading to their destination. This will help people decide whether to drive, take public transit, bike, or walk. When people choose to drive, new SF park meters will make paying easier. In addition to taking coins, the new meters will accept credit cards and SFMTA parking cards. Parking time limits will be extended. Easier payment and extended time limits will help drivers avoid tickets. Prices at city-owned parking garages will be adjusted to provide an attractive alternative to either parking. Parking rates will be adjusted based on demand once a month, never by more than 50 cents. So in areas where it seems nearly impossible to find a parking space, rates will increase until at least one space is available most of the time. And in areas where open parking spaces are plentiful, rates will decrease until most of the empty space is filled or until rates bottom out at as little as 25 cents per hour. SF Park is designed to ensure that drivers easily find an open space near their destination. Well, it's it's easier to, to, to do this in a video than in, in the real world, but they've been doing it for, for more than uh, 
uh, 10 years now. Uh, the, the, they've ex expanded into all the meters of the city, and many other cities are, are, are doing it. Los Angeles does it in some neighborhoods, Washington, D.C., Boston, and, and some others. And the thing that surprised me more than anything else is that, uh, that the average meter price has declined. Um, they uh, partly because so many of this, when you charge the same price, price all day long, it's too high at sometimes and too low at others, and it had been far too high in the morning. Uh, and they uh, many uh, streets got down to twenty five cents an hour, um, just because they had been overpriced. Uh, and I think that it should go down to zero if the if their space is empty at that price. Uh, so it's a, you only pay more if, if there are no spaces that are open. Now, some people think that this is so difficult because the price parking meters they're used to are identical to this one from 1935. This is the first parking meter in the United States when it was invented and installed in Oklahoma City. And the current ones are like this, except they're less streamlined um, and they're electronic rather than wind up. Um, uh, but uh, there are many more uh, uh, important ways to charge for curb parking now. You can pay by your cell phone, and you can pay for it by multi-space parking meters. Here's one on campus. It doesn't tell you what the price of parking is until you touch any button, and then it tells you the, the price at that time. Um, uh, and this is on campus. Um, that the first hour is three dollars, uh, the second hour is four dollars. Uh, so it's a progressive price, uh, uh, and it's right across from the law school library. And you see Murphy Hall in the background. You see one of these meters at the left, uh, and, and there are eight spaces, uh, which is the average number of spaces on a uh, curved spaces on a, on a, a, a street in it most cities in the United States, they're not diagonal, but, uh, but they're hard, but they're parallel parking is usually about, about eight spaces is, uh, is average. And this is the occupancy that you ought to have. One out of eight, eight spaces are vacant. You see somebody paying at the meter. So I set up my camera across from this uh, this uh, parking meter and, and, and took a picture every four minutes. I, I think the students suspect that the professors have a lot of time on their hands, <laughs> and I think this proves it. But so here, every four minutes, you'll see cars coming and going. That uh, there was one time when there were all spaces were occupied, but that didn't last long. But you, normally, you see people paying at the meter, so. So some, at that price, the coming and the going is balanced well. And this this is so anybody who wants to park there can find the space. And before before this happened, there were people waiting for spaces. There would be a long line of cars waiting to get a parking space uh, at the uh, uh, at the curb. There was once there were three spaces, but then they filled up. So I think that this should, do you think the price should have been higher? I mean, four, $4 an hour to charge students to go to the library? Well, if it, if it, were, if it were higher, there would be um, uh, a lower occupancy rate and fewer students could come. Should it be lower? Well, then people would have to drive around hunting for parking. So I think it is the Goldilocks principle or like the Supreme Court's definition of por pornography. I know it when I see it. Everybody can become an expert on parking prices. You can be an expert on parking prices because you just look at the curve and you can tell whether the price is too high or too low. Um, and I don't think anybody can say that they know a better way to set the, the, the price of parking. Most, most parking meter prices are not demand-based. They're politics-based, um, and I think that because they're politics-based, you have to spend the meter revenue on the metered block to get the politics right so that people will say, yes, I want demand-based uh, prices for parking meters on my block.
because it would, it, uh, one of the reasons you want to do it is not just for politics, but to uh, eliminate the idea of driving around hunting for a parking space. Um, uh, the, we've all done it. Uh, the, so you know what exactly what it is. Uh, and it's a bother to you, but it's also a bother for everybody else because you're polluting the air, you're wasting fuel, you're increasing uh, carbon emissions. There are a lot of damage that is done by cruising for parking. And I did... Um, uh, uh, find all the studies that have been done back to 1927, almost a hundred years ago, and then appropriately in Detroit, where they tried to estimate how long it took to find a parking space um, or uh, and what share of the, the traffic was hunting for parking. And this, these are about 25 cities on four continents over a hundred years. Um, and the average in the place that they looked was 32% uh, of the traffic was cruising for parking. Some people mistakenly say that, that a third of all traffic is cruising for parking. That's not true. It's only in areas where people did these studies. You do a study where there is going to be cruising. You don't look for an area where there isn't, like in most places, uh, like in your own neighborhood. Uh, but where parking is overcrowded and the traffic is congested, it's causing a lot of problems around the world for a hundred years. Um, and it will continue doing this unless we reform. Um, and it seems so unfair as well that whenever you're cruising, you want to cruise, you want to avoid following right behind another car that's cruising because they'll get the space. So you hang back and that slows down the traffic. Uh, and then in your rear view mirror, you see that you missed a space. It just seems so unfair. Um, and at least a very dangerous behavior. Uh, uh, I, people see a, a space open on the other side of the street and they make a U-turn in traffic. Uh, here's the grainy footage that I got with my camera. Well, I was able to interview the driver. She got out of the car and she told me that she does whatever it takes to get a curb parking space in Westwood Village. I'm now, not offended. <laughs> that, uh, well, what happens at the curb? It seems like I'm talking about a very minor part of the world. Uh, that, uh, but what happens at the curb doesn't stay at the curb. Uh, because there's a butterfly effect that uh, the, the butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil could lead to a tornado in Texas. Uh, or what John Wooden said, little things make big things happen. Um, that underpriced curb parking leads to the shortages and, and, and having to, to cruise for parking. Uh, and that leads to demands for off-street parking requirements. There's not a, there are parking shortages. Don't you understand that? How do po politicians permit these buildings to be there without off-street parking? Uh, and that spreads the city apart. Uh, cars become necessary. If you could park free just about everywhere you go, except UCLA, uh, but you can park free at Ralph's, and you can park free at uh, the barber shop and most restaurants and things like that. That uh, the the cars are everywhere. And if everything is spread apart, you, you need more cars, and that leads to more, more parking. Um, and then as they're spread out, and there's uh, more traffic, that nobody wants to bike, uh, the, the congestion slows public transit. Uh, so cars are the natural way to go anywhere. Um, and it accelerates. So this is a butterfly effect, that nobody would but think that curb parking can cause all these problems. But I think it's something that we can fix, uh, that some cities are fixing, uh, and it, 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 it will, we, if, we, if you could show, uh, I tried to show that, uh, that this small thing, it seems like at the curb, uh, leads to catastrophic consequences. And I think that, if you're getting rid of minimum parking requirements, it'll have a cascade of, of, of benefits because uh, you'll see 
curb space is open everywhere. Uh, and then the, the demand for all street parking requirements will seem quite foolish. Um, and if you don't have to provide all street parking, then it, it'll make everything cheaper except parking. Um, and you can have a lot of infill developments like I did with Photoshop, but much, much more small, uh, fine grain that there'll be uh, parking lots in Westwood Village that now you can see or will be uh, uh, filled in with, with uh, housing. And they will have a lot of uh, benefits that will that will benefit the whole world, not just uh, the, the one city. Uh, and I think nobody will say that well, was you getting charging for curb parking had all these benefits, but I think they will. Um, and the only people who are going to be hurt are the people who now park free on crowded streets, uh, which is which is. Which is many of us, but I think that in our role as every other role we have in life, uh, we'll be better off. So I think what I think is really important before you won't get anything happening unless the politics are right. Um, you can't have a planner or an academic saying this is <laughs> this is what you ought to do. You have to get the politics right, and they got it right in Pasadena. Some of you may be old enough to know that. Uh, old Pasadena used to be a commercial skid row. It, it was a commercial slum. Um, uh, and, and they didn't have parking meters, so the city wanted to put in parking meters, but this is the image that most people have of a parking meter. That uh, they, Maybe the, the, the money goes to pay for the war in Iraq or something like that. that um, but when people know they're getting the money, uh, they think differently about paying for parking. This is a picture taken during the 1984 Olympics when around the Coliseum, but it happens around the Coliseum at every big event, is that the residents park their cars on the street and rent out their driveways to people who are going to the Coliseum. And many people, they, they have regular customers. People know where they want to go. And it's much better for the Coliseum afterwards because instead of everybody trying to drive away from a parking lot at the same time, they walk four or five or even 10 blocks to get their car uh, after they paid the residence. Um, so old Pasadena was, uh, it, 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 I can remember definitely when it was a, a, a terrible place. And I, uh, people were even, they wouldn't let their children get off the bus at old Pasadena. This is what it looks like now. How did it change? Uh, well, I think it changed mainly because of parking meters with revenue return. Um, that the, uh, the city wanted to install parking meters, but it, the merchants objected saying it'll chase away the few customers we have. I mean, that, that the, uh, everything above the ground floor was empty and um, some of the ground floor stores were empty. But then uh, Rick Cole, the mayor, in sort of, it, 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 a meeting with the he, he, with the uh, merchants and the property owners uh, said, all right, if we put in the meters, we'll uh, pay for, uh, use all the money to, to pay for uh, uh, repaving the sidewalks, cleaning up the alleys, planting street trees. And the merchants and the property owners said, well, why didn't you tell us that? Let's run the meters till midnight. Let's, 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 let's uh, uh, run them on Sunday. Uh, and the only thing that changed was uh, Rick Cole sort of blurted out, sort of <laughs> on, uh, from, uh, just uh, he thought of it just before he said it, we'll give you the money. And they get more than a million dollars a year. They borrowed $5 million to rebuild all the sidewalks um, and uh, put in historic light fixtures and um, uh, street furniture. They did everything the government can do to improve a neighborhood. And here was a, a comment from the head of the advisory board that they produced and that they appointed an advisory board to say what to do with the money. It, it was an easy sell. Once they knew they were getting the money. 
here's what it looked like before. There's nothing wrong with Martin Morgan Michaels, uh, but uh, here, here is now, you see, well, I can say it went too fast. You see before and after. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the background, there's an office building, which was part of an uh, urban renewal project. They tore down a lot of old Pasadena uh, to build glass walled buildings. But anyway, once the city put in street trees, and historic street lights, and fixed up the sidewalks, it was a lot better. And, and historic preservation is very expensive. Um, you have to scrape off you know, decades of paint, uh, repair everything. But once the city does what only the city can do, then the private property owners came through with, uh, with uh, repairing their property. Here was an empty tire warehouse. It had been empty for years. It became a Saks Fifth Avenue. Uh, now, that was the wrong place for a Saks Fifth Avenue. Um, uh, but uh, it was off of Colorado Boulevard, but it was replaced by uh, the tenant became a, a uh, Forever 21, which is where I want to buy my clothes. You know. And the alleys were full of mattresses, dead animals. They became walkways. So people want to walk around in the alleys. Have you been to another city where people want to walk around the alleys? Uh, the, the buildings have two front doors, one onto Colorado Boulevard and one onto the, uh, onto the, uh, onto the alley. So the, 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 uh, the instead of it being, uh, the meters being any harm to the residents, the, in the next five years, the sales tax revenue, which is a measure of business activity, tripled. As soon as they, they put in the parking meters and spent the money, that the private operators came through uh, with, with many stores that hire many people. Now, 25 or 30,000 people come around just to come to Old Pasadena just to walk around uh, on, the, um, on the weekend. And many of the Ameridae can remember when people used to come to Westwood Village to walk around. Well, in the same year that Pasadena put in the parking meters, uh, the the merchants in Westwood convinced the city to reduce the price of parking from a dollar an hour to 50 cents an hour. And when there was a shortage of curb parking, do you think that reducing the meter's price was going to help anybody? But because the meter money went straight to the general fund, the, the merchants said, well, let's try it. Let's cut the, the parking meter price. So Westwood Village failed and it had been so successful and Pasadena thrived when it had been such a, a, a commercial slum. Um, so I think that, uh, let me see, I guess, yeah, I'm gonna say yes, yes, that there, that there are many reasons that people will want uh, this, there will be political support. Parking benefit districts are about political support. Uh, the liberals will see it as uh, spending a lot of money and conservatives uh, have a lot to get from this. It, it relies on markets and the government is not telling you what to do. Um, and the environmentalists, of course, have everything to gain from this. Um, and businesses, if they want to open a business, if you want to open a restaurant, you don't have to provide a lot of parking. Uh, previously, if you didn't have the required parking, you couldn't open the restaurant. So a lot of historic buildings could not be reused. And the new urbanists uh, think that you could live in high density without being overrun by cars. And uh, libertarians, they can't neglect them, uh, but it, uh, it shifts the decisions down from cities to property owners and businesses. Um, and the property rights advocates have a lot to gain from this. The, and developers understand that the, the government is not telling them how many parking spaces to, to provide. And, and in residential areas, you can see that it, it pays for a lot of things where you live. Uh, and if you're an affordable housing advocate, it reduces the cost of building new housing. Uh, and uh, there's people who like neighborhood government, uh, that's a good idea. And I think the biggest beneficiaries will be these uh, local elect, uh, uh, elected officials. They won't have to sit through endless um, 
council meetings about parking requirements and parking meters and all that sort of thing. Pretend to be interested and even an expert on this. What do we do with all the parked cars that we, that we won't need? Uh, here's a sculpture in France called Long-Term Parking. And it was, uh, 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 the sculptor was a guy named Armand who formerly taught at UCLA. And he was famous for what he called accumulation art. What about all the parking structures that we built and that we won't need? Well, I think here's something we could do that UCLA could make a very good use of this. So we have a lot of people whose backside I think would ornament our parking garages. Well, a planner uh, can't conclude with anything better than a quote from uh, Jane Jacobs. Um, uh, we are a wealthy country because of what you and I have done. Uh, we live in a wealthy country uh, because we owe a lot to the past. Um, 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 and Dwight D. Eisenhower said somewhat the same thing. It was his famous farewell speech uh, when he warned against the military industrial complex. Um, and we seem to be plundering the resources of tomorrow at a rate that President Eisenhower could not have imagined. Well, our greatest writer among presidents, of course, was Abraham Lincoln. And I think our case is due as time to think anew about parking and to act anew. Well, you probably don't often hear a professor ending a lecture with quotes from two Republican presidents, um, but I suspect almost everyone will agree with Eisenhower and Lincoln. Despite all the institutional inertia and in urban planning, um, uh, reforms are sprouting, as I showed the, 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 the number of cities are, are removing off street parking requirements. I hope Los Angeles will be. In fact, parts of most of Los Angeles, much of Los Angeles already has a removed off street parking requirements because the state government now prohibits cities as of this year prevent cities from requiring off street parking within a half mile of public transit. And that includes uh, uh, the Westwood Village and a lot of other the rest of Los Angeles. So we'll see whether these things that I've been um, uh, advocating for a long time, whether uh, good things happen. But, um, but the parking problem will always be with us unless, unless GM General Motors succeeds with one property strategy that, that is, is it working on. Well, if this uh, technology works out, it can restore the leadership of the, uh, of the American automobile industry. Um, well, Parking is free for cars, but housing is expensive for people. And we have our priorities exactly the wrong way around. Um, uh, cities have, have, have made great mistakes in planning for parking. Uh, and I hope all of you can help correct it. Um, um, well, that's about all I know, so I better stop. Thank you, you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And I, I hope to some of you are still here in the Zoom session and can uh, make comments and ask questions. Thanks again. Thank you so much. We do have some people who are asking questions um, and I'll put your book information in the chat as well. Um, so let's start with Meg, you have your hand up? Yeah, um, I don't know if this is an appropriate question for you, but there's a property I've been really uh, concerned about on Westwood Boulevard in the village. And I just wonder if you know anything about it. So it's a former Mexican restaurant. I can't even now remember what it was called, like a Chewy's or something. I used to eat there. And it's sat vacant now for um, for close to 15 years um, since, since like 2007, 2008. Um, do you know if the parking requirements are something that's preventing um, the site from getting rented? And if so, do you know if any loosening of these um, requirements now that you just mentioned um, bode anything better for the property? Well, I'm sure that, the, well, I don't know the restaurant, but I'm sure that the situation will change because uh, that uh, there are a lot of restaurants in Westwood, Village 
but they if, it, if a restaurant closes, uh, another restaurant can move in, even if it doesn't meet the parking requirements. That uh, if, 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 yes, if you're, if you're grandfathered in, that you, you're, you're, the, a lot of the buildings in Westwood were built before there were minimum parking requirements. So if you're a restaurant in Westwood Village and you go out of business, another restaurant can move in. But if the restaurant has been, uh, the building has been vacant for more than a year, you lose the grandfathered right. And this happened after the the, the uh, riots in '67, where a lot of uh, older buildings were, were were damaged, and they couldn't be revived because they didn't have the required parking. Um, and so I think that the parking requirement prevents the reuse of old buildings. Often they tear down historic buildings to provide parking lots for the building next door. And now that we, uh, that anything can open up in that uh, in that ex Mexican restaurant, and I suspect it will be uh, something will move in. Yeah. So that closed during the Great Recession. So probably um, it would have been very difficult in the following year for another restaurant to come in at that time because so many businesses were failing. So I wonder if that's that's what happened. Well, I, I'm crossing my fingers, you know. I think one of the other things that it will, will uh, change is that you can get a variance in the urban planning. You can, the city council can say, well, this is not allowed, but I will make an exception for you. Uh, and this gives city council members something they can give away. Um, and I think that uh, the, the, the only analogy I, literary analogy I have for this is in the Brothers Karamazov, where the, the, uh, uh, the Grand Inquisitor of Spain in the 15th century was explaining why the church was popular, even though it, it, it made sinful, or you go to hell for very simple things like eating meet on Friday or something. And, the, and the, the, the Grand Inquisitor said, every sin is forgiven if it is done with our permission. And that's what variances are on urban planning, where you can do anything you want if you have our permission. And that leads to corruption in the city council. Mm, interesting. So um, the next hand I saw was Randy. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. I couldn't unmute. Uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed um, your presentation. Um, it, I have some questions uh, about uh, handicap parking, um, which is a pet peeve of mine because most people I see walking out of their car does not look like, uh, it looks like they're using somebody else's permit. Let's just put it that way. Um, could you address that? Well, that's a, a, a big issue for me, that especially in Westwood Village, because UCLA is right next, which charges a hundred dollars a month for yellow permits now, I think, and for right on the periphery, if you have a, a, a disabled placard, you can park for free at a meter all day long. And so, what happens is many of the meter spaces right near campus are you just have to walk along the con, and you see they all have disabled placards. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, they don't all have to be uh, stolen permits or bought permits because 12% of all drivers in California have a disabled placard. That, uh, and I think that the, the, the pieces of legislation I'm pushing for, but I haven't gotten very far on, is to do what Michigan and Illinois have done, is that they had the same problem we have. <clears throat> Okay, went to a two-tier system that people who have severe mobility problems uh, can get a, a special placard. It's like a placard with stripes on it, and you can park free to meter. Everybody else who has a placard doesn't get to park free to meter. They can park at the, in the disabled spaces of the grocery stores and things like that, but they have to pay at the meter. And when Michigan did this, they sent out uh, uh, probably a letter then everybody who had a placard saying we have a new system. If you, uh, uh, if you are, have severe 
uh, mobility problems and your doctor uh, will certify this under penalty of being disbarred if it's not legitimate, uh, then you can get at this, at this special tier, uh, upper tier placard. And guess what percentage of the people with placards applied for the severe mobility bond? It was 3%. And I think yeah. if, if California followed what Michigan and Illinois have already done, we would have the same effect. Okay. Um, okay, let's, I think I saw Al's hand and then Michael and then um, a chat. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Shoup. You haven't lost your irreverent sense of humor. I'm glad to hear that. And uh, I have a question. Were you consulted about parking when the Nimoy Theater opened? Hmm. Well, for people at UCLA, you could park in uh, uh, Lot 32 and walk. Um, but what think... about hmm? public? who are not affiliated with UCLA. How are they well, going to fill a theater? That theater was built in, I think, 19, in the 1930s. Hmm. And it can't be retrofitted with parking requirements. In fact, it could never be uh, used the way it is now without a variance to, 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 from the city. Well, maybe because it's UCLA. If, it, if, 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 if UCLA owns it, they're exempt from minimum parking requirements. So it's up to you to decide to, to just where to park. That that too often you, people are saying, "Where am I going to park?" Just what you said. Well, that's up to you. Um, you could you could uh, you could pay for parking in a meter uh, because it's metered in front of it. If you're at UCLA, you could park at Lot Thirty Two and walk, but. The, the, it's almost like saying we shouldn't have allowed the Nimoy Theater if the Nimoy Theater doesn't have all street parking. It, it, it shifts the, the responsibility to the driver to find parking. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay, Michael, and then I'll do the chat question. Okay. And, and that was from Al, who is a uh, public transportation advocate. Um, yeah, gotcha. Um, I, have, I have seen some uh, strip mall like enterprises and their owners have espoused converting to from not just a single level retail or restaurant establishment to a multi story uh, with residential spaces above. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be in the the new way in new construction but this is be a renovation uh so creating housing above existing enterprises is there an impact to that uh, what what about quote parking for the residents in that case please well, I, I'm a big fan of unbundling parking uh, from housing. That you uh, now, when you buy a, a rented apartment, you expect uh, two parking spaces. That's the requirement in, in, in Los Angeles for a new parking new new apartment building has to have two parking spaces. Except now, the state has prohibited parking requirements in in large parts of Los Angeles. Uh, so I think that. Uh, It'll morph into what what happens, I think, in more civilized areas. You can rent housing and you can rent parking, but those are two different choices. If you want to pay for parking, you can have parking. If you if you don't have parking, you don't pay for uh, it. Doesn't it, it doesn't raise your, the rent of your housing? So when you separate them, then well, it'll it'll reveal how much it costs to build parking spaces. Um, that nobody's going to build them unless the rent they get for it is worth paying for. That I think will morph slowly to a, a place, a, a, a life where most of us have one car and electric bicycles, we have scooters, we have. Uh, 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 we have legs. These, there are a lot of alternatives to driving. Uh, but it's up to the it, it'll be up to the homeowner or the renter to say uh, uh, 
do I want to live in this building? That is, <laughs> one developer said, if I provide, if people don't want to live in my building because I didn't provide enough parking, that's my problem. So the developers will provide parking if they think the tenants are willing to pay for it. But there's no reason to build it if the tenants are not willing to pay for it. Okay. Very and, practical. Um, there's a question in the chat from Sherry. What is your answer for lower wage earners, such as gardeners and house cleaners who need secure parking for their vehicles that they rely on to do their work? Well, yes, I think the, the, the one thing, there are several things I would recommend. And one thing that UCLA tried and gave up, and that is giving free transit passes to all people who work at UCLA. That was from 2000 to 2003. We had um, the, the Bruin Pass. And during that time, uh, it became very clear that the biggest users were the low paid staff at the, at the medical center. There are a lot of low paid workers who, who now UCLA does not, does, does not pay for their part. It doesn't offer them uh, a free transit pass. Um, the, 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 but, the, but we pay a lot for, but we built very expensive parking spaces for them. The most recent parking garage on campus cost $84,000 a space. And that's in the Luscombe Conference Center. Do you think <laughs> that UCLA should keep build more spaces so people could drive to work and not offer free parking, not uh, free transit? Now, I think it, the, the one another thing that I'll, I'll sort of climb off my horse and say that if that is your concern, you could give lower prices for lower income people. We give we give discounts on electricity for low income houses. We give discounts on water for low income houses. We could, if we want to, give discounts on parking to lower income households. But I don't think you should give low discounts on parking to low income people unless you give the same amount of money to low income people who do not own a car. Usually the sympathy is only with people who own a car for low income people who own a car and no sympathy for people who, who don't own a car. So I think, yes, I think it's important that low income people should have access to cars. Uh, because that's access to employment in many cases. But I don't think it means we should subsidize uh, parking for drivers without subsidizing the people who don't drive. Right. Okay, um, everyone, you can feel free to unmute yourself so we can have more of a dialogue conversation. Um, I, do, I saw Meg's hand go up, so go ahead, Meg, and I saw your chat too. Yeah, well, the main point I wanted to make, especially vis-a-vis -vis UCLA, is that the transit options going to and from campus are absolutely stellar. And I feel like um, if I could change just one thing in the world, it would be to let all older people in Los Angeles know just how great the services are, particularly the bus. There are so many apps now that people can use to um, figure out where to go and to time it really just look on Google Maps. I, I recently took somebody I worked with for 16 years on campus on a bus ride to her house. She had never done it in 16 years. She, when she arrived at home, she said her husband's jaw just dropped. She, he couldn't believe she'd done it. It's so obvious. It's so there. And it costs us 35 cents. It All old people should be doing this. <laughs> yes, in my opinion. Yeah. Young people too. UCLA has 180 buses arriving and leaving per hour on campus at the peak hours. 180 buses an hour come here and leave. Wow. Um, so I think but everybody has to pay for it, uh, at least except for the students. But I think it would be much better if the university said, we'll go back to what we tried and we'll give, instead of building more parking, uh, um, and we will uh, we will offer free transit. Uh, they could do it even just for the lowest. In um, the I think it's beyond UCLA, though. I feel like Metro um, needs to have almost sort of a, an ambassador program where the, the time that you're almost 62, you're 61 or something, they send you a letter 
and give you like a two month free senior pass just so that you know how to do it. Maybe link you up at that point with a high school kid who's trying to get some sort of um, volunteer hours so that the high school kid can show you how to use all the different apps. The only, the only barrier now to entry for older people, it's not money. It's so cheap. It's getting that one card at 62 that allows you to go the whole distance of the county for 35 cents mm -hmm. and then educating older people how to do it. I think you're right. And, but I, I, and I also think that the, the, the main thing that the Metro lacks is riders. A lot of the buses are very under-occupied. Uh, I think that uh, moving parking into a market <laughs> economy will increase the demand for public transit. If you could park free where you're going, why would you ride the bus? Um, that, uh, that you have to walk to it, the bus stops are often dirty, they're unshaded. Uh, but I think that if we start charging for parking, um, uh, that there are people, more people will ride the bus. And that's where the revenue will come from, that we have good transit. It's just we don't have many riders. Yeah, there was a comment made about a lot of um, the audience is an older population who might have more restrictions to driving or other issues that makes driving prohibitive. Um, so does this conflict with making more inclusive parking for those with disabilities if they're less people driving. Is that kind of sum it up, Steve? Well, I was, I mean, I'm just thinking that that one size may not fit all. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Don, about 20 years ago or 25 years ago, you, you quit the faculty association because we wouldn't advocate for uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, parking restrictions for faculty. And, and uh, uh, even then I sympathize with you, but I, I think that, that I would have been lynched if I had taken that position. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so, uh, you know, we're, we, we have a resistance problem, but I'm also a fan of Jane Jacobs. And, uh, you know, a lot of what she suggested 50 years ago is is embedded in in in, uh, in what you're saying, and she was right then, and you're probably right now. Mm. Well, but I think you're right. You were right as well. That I think before anything is going to happen, it has the politics have to be right. Um, and I think that the the parking benefit districts are one way to get the politics right, but. I think that certainly university faculty are just as selfish as anybody else when it comes to parking. I think that, you know, uh, that uh, staunch conservatives become ardent communists when it comes to parking. And, uh, uh, rational people quickly become emotional when it comes to parking. I think, I think your mental ability shift to a lower level when you think about parking. Is that, uh, that I think, I, I hope there's no neuroscientist here, but I think that thinking about parking happens in what's called the reptilian cortex. It's the most primitive part of the brain that was <laughs> all to make stem decisions on how to avoid being eaten uh, or ritual display or territorial claims and things like that. That's that's the part of the brain we used to think about parking. Um, but uh, I, I that's why I gave up on many of the things on campus, although that I think things are changing back because I, uh, I there were thugs who were in charge of the parking system back in, the, in that time. I won't name them, but you'll probably remember the names. Um, and they just wanted to build more parking. Um, and uh, they, they they despised me. <laughs> it was, and I was, I was on the the, the board of the, the transportation services, so I could hear what they had to say. And it, the, the, 
that they, I mean, the head of the parking system had previously been the head of the child care center. I mean, it isn't as though they're experts on transportation. Um, and they, I had argued for these free transit passes for faculty and students, and they, they were so fed up with listening to me, they said, well, go to other campuses and see what they do. So I went up and down the West Coast and San Diego, UC San Diego and UC Santa Cruz already had these uh, uh, free transit passes for, for, for students. And I pushed on you know, from here at UCLA and they, they, the, the, the uh, head of it made the mistake of saying, oh, he, I, 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 was, I was in the, in the room, he, I'll give it a million dollars. I'm sure it will be a mistake. He thought it was a pilot program. It was the biggest mistake he ever made because for three years we had free transit for faculty and staff and students and it was costing the parking service a lot of money. Um, and it was, it was, it was subsidizing a, 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 a competitor to what they sell. I mean, it was just awful for them. And it was so much cheaper than the campus shuttle bus, which was then costing $3 a ride. You know, we often get on the campus shuttle to go various places, but that has a cost and it's free. It was $3 a ride. We were paying 25 cents a ride to the blue bus. And that was just terrible for the head of the parking service. So they, they ended it. Uh, uh, but the students, uh, and the, so the students had to pay for restoring it, and they, the the park resource said the students will never buy this. All we were the last campus in the UC system for the they put up to a a, a, a vote of the students. Do you want to have free transit? And it passed by seven eighty seven percent, and that's partly because the turnout is so low, and the, the people who were already riding transit, of course, would vote for it. <laughs> And it's uh, so now the, we have uh, we have for the students they have free transit. Now, I wish the faculty would get it, but we're you know, yeah, you know, yeah, you, you've hinted at the issue and the questions did. But what about social justice hmm. and and the, the you know the, the commuting and and the um, uh, and working from home has simply exaggerated the social injustices in that the lower wage people are disproportionately required to come to campus. Do you think that argument is going to have legs? It should, but do you think it will? Well, it's never worked for me. <laughs> I, I think you have to appeal to people's self-interest. When it comes to Parker, you have to figure out a way to appeal to people's self-interest. Well, Even for, I mean, you could just supplement salaries for those who have to appear on to, to campus, just adjust the salary levels. Well, I think that you can, uh, I, 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 I'm not going to spend, you know, my time on that because I think that's, uh, you know, I, we have a little time left. <laughs> we want to figure out what we can do. But I think there is one thing, maybe I'm kind of worn out by now, and I'm sure you are too, but let me just finish with one story that um, I still teach a course on, uh, on parking every year on campus. Uh, and um, I was uh, talking about the new uh, uh, apartment building for students that replaced the extension building. Remember where the extension building was at the corner of, of um, I guess, LeCant and Gailey. Uh, and they were the big building. I was surprised they tore it down. But I think they, the UCLA contracted with a private operator who builds dormitory. They're not dormitory, they're apartment buildings. Mm. Uh, now it's a 16 story apartment building. Uh, the, one, two, or three bedroom apartments, and they, they have two beds in each bedroom, and it has no parking. And you might say, well, where are people going to park? Uh, well, right diagonally across from that, there was a, a, a new office building, which is only three stories high, uh, the diagonal corner uh, on Gailey, the northwest corner. 
well, I guess the southeast corner of Gailey and Lacan. And it's a three-story parking building, and a, a three-story office building. And I looked at it, and I usually take pictures of the gigantic parking garage that they have to dig underneath it before they get permission to build a building. And that started before the 16-story building, uh, apartment building was, was started. And, it's, and the, uh, the, the office building still hasn't been finished. And it's, it has this gigantic parking garage underneath that, that, that's hidden away. The, the, the cost of parking is hidden in so many ways. But when you build a building, the, the, the parking spaces are hidden and the cost of parking is hidden. But you can see when you get rid of a parking requirement, you can on the, the two diagonal lots on one intersection. One is a 16-story apartment building and one is a small three-story um, office building. Uh, and I think that when we start allowing uh, buildings without parking, you'll find that there are many people who say, I can live without a car at UCLA. Uh, if I if I don't have to pay for parking, you know I think the 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 the, the you know the butterfly effect I was talking about. I think that we've had these butterflies working in favor of of all the mess for a hundred years, and I think if we start now to have um, more sensible parking policies, that a lot of things will follow through with, with uh, cheaper housing, much more housing, better looking housing, uh, uh, more restaurants, uh, the, 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 the city will begin filling in uh, with, with uh, to re replace parking. People will re replace cars. It'll, it'll uh, not in my lifetime, I'm sure, but it will happen. I think I'm lucky enough, and I hope you are too, to see that some of the things that you advocated when you were a professor uh, have paid off in terms of uh, people agreeing, well, maybe he was right. Uh, that, uh, uh, and, and I think it's important, like in that uh, city I talked about where they changed just the word required to recommend it, is that is you can make a complete U-turn without even thinking you were once going in a different direction, in the opposite direction. Well, we've done that with urban planning before, that it used to be we tore down what we thought were slums and built uh, urban renewal, and now we want to have historic preservation. Um, and we realized that urban renewal was a disaster. And we once thought that high-rise public housing was the solution to housing for low-income people. And a lot of that is torn down, and we have scattered site housing. So we... In urban planning, we have made these big U-turns um, and forgotten that we were going in a different direction. And I think at least the, the these maps that people produce saying, well, here are all the new cities that don't have parking requirements. It is showing that, that we're moving in the right direction, uh, but it will it, it took us decades to understand that we were going in the wrong direction. And I think it'll take us decades to really move far on the right direction. But I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to talk to you and uh, to get your uh, responses, and especially to Aisha. She, she's, uh, she's, she takes care of us all. Uh, and I think uh, many thanks to you, Aisha. Thank you. I've been trying to get this on the calendar for a while. I I had heard about the Shoe Pistas and your nickname as Shoop Dog. So I really wanted to kind of have this dialogue and I will put in the chat, oh, sorry, I will send a follow-up email with Professor Shoop's slides, um, the Facebook page, um, his book. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, that was my parking space and they knew it. Um, but thank you for that, for that fun. Um, piece of uh, video. Um, final questions. I think we should wrap it up, but if anyone has any burning comments or questions, um, now's your chance. Uh, I will say, just as I put in the chat, during the pandemic, there was a lot of upset and frustration when we were allotted to work remotely because a lot of departments who are facilities or landscaping, they still had to come to campus. They still had to pay for parking. Um, it was definitely more of an uproar 
during the pandemic for those who did not have the privilege of having the type of position here where we could work remotely. So, um, you know, I'm not quite sure how the campus eased those upset folks, um, but it was definitely something that was brought up at every single town hall, every single meeting that we had with um, Chancellor Block and uh, President um, Drake. Lots of people were really upset because those who are the lower wage earners through facilities and dining services still had to come to campus. They still had to clock in and work and pay for parking. So um, I'll leave it at that. Um, again, thank you, Professor Shoup. And I will send a follow-up email to everyone. Have a great morning and a good afternoon and take care. Thank you. Bye.